best was Christopher Pardini of Fanteras, and that was a uh, performed by the solo player of the House of Organic and Chamber Music, Olena Matsaluk. So with this organic note, let's consider our official closing ceremony, in spite of the fact that we still have a lot of things on the agenda for tomorrow and for the day after tomorrow. So let's consider this opening closing, this closing ceremony uh, to be open. In fact, actually, one of the big achievements of this Congress was the fact that women's uh, manifesto uh, passed unanimously. So I want to congratulate you and everybody who also uh, who is not here with this. Uh, the Congress is coming to an end, but the activities are continuing. Tomorrow we have several major panels with uh, great panelists from around the world touching on the topics which are important not only on not only for us writers or journalists, but for the uh, nations, the whole nations around us, because, I mean, the writers and the journalists and the member of Pan International, they are trying to look around and to see what is happening in their countries, in neighboring countries, and in the whole of the world. Among other achievements, uh, I'm extremely happy that it was here in Lviv that four new pen centers were welcomed. Pen Center of Gambia, of Cuba, of South India and of St. Petersburg. A great number of resolutions were passed on the situations in countries where the writers and journalists are repressed or disappearing. And uh, I can name only several of these resolutions. First of all, of course, on uh, Russia, uh, on Ukraine, on Kazakhstan, on Turkey, uh, on Venezuela and it was all uh, thanks to your activities and thanks to your engagement. Thank you. Uh, I want also to thank everybody for mentioning and remembering the cases of uh, killed and uh, disappeared or kidnapped writers and journalists. Uh, first of all, the evening we had great evening to stress again the demands and our demands uh, on, of release of Alexei Sov, who is three years already in Russian prison, but also uh, the case of uh, Pavel Sheremet, who was killed in Kiev, actually 200 meters from my home, and my wife heard the explosion early in the morning. We didn't know what was it. We found out, although very quickly. Uh, we are sharing, and I want to, that us not to forget the cases of disappeared uh, Syrian activists and journalists. And uh, also we have to keep talking about this and naming the people who are under threat or already uh, imprisoned, because this is one of the main purposes of the existence of Pan International. And uh, probably uh, I could go on and go on talking about the report on Ukraine and freedom of uh, press, etc. But uh, we are here uh, not only to listen to the presenters. I mean, I'm here as a presenter. I'm trying to learn new profession. Uh, but uh, more important is actually to listen to those without whose engagement, engagement with heart, nerves, and even muscles, this Congress wouldn't be possible. So, a great of um, a great many of things have happened uh, over this Congress. And by the way, there has been uh, the translation uh, done of the number, the place by uh, Alexei Tsov, and soon it will be produced on the stages of theaters. We printed uh, a lot of documents on 30 um, boxes uh, with packs of um, paper, and a lot of resolutions have been passed. A lot of decisions have been made, which are of importance. Um, and I would like to invite a person who would like to provide us with a warm atmosphere for this evening. Do we have our colleague from the Vietnam pen, Vietnamese pen, with a poem dedicated to Vasil Stus? He was very much worried about uh, r reciting this poem. So whenever he comes here, please um, uh, tell us that you are here. So. 
so Vietnamese band, no, not yet here. All right, then we now, when, then we are welcoming for the uh, speech uh, the president of Pan International, Jennifer Clement. You're welcome. I want to take this opportunity to thank Ukrainian Pen and especially Mikola and Andrei. Also thank the supporting institutions and all the marvelous Ukrainian volunteers. I also want to thank the Penn membership, my board, and the extraordinary staff at our London office. Over these days, we have passed important resolutions, a woman's manifesto, and even changed our charter to be more reflective of the times we live in. Also, we have stood and remembered writers at risk or in prison and defended truth and protested against lies and propaganda. We have joined with the voices of the Ukrainian people and said, two plus two is four. I know we have had our differences and moments of debate, but what is so special about Penn is that you know that everybody works from the best intentions. We are writers, which makes us all, I'm happy to say, people of passions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, I want to say uh, just one thing. Uh, this Congress in Ukraine was a great test for Ukrainian PEN, and everybody at PEN was nervous, except the president, who was always sure everything will be fine. I want to invite Mikola Rebchuk to share his positive feelings about the event. Um, my dear PEN fellows, dear guests, it's one of my happiest day, days in my life. Uh, our event passed without major failures, without major disasters. Uh, but it's also a very sad day for me because uh, our paths diverge uh, tomorrow, and some of you would depart back home, some of you would take uh, entertainment and sightseeing, and some would continue to work. We have tomorrow four panels, and uh, all of them are arranged in a way they, they, they don't overlap. So the most enthusiastic of you may attend all of them from early morning till late evening. Uh, today, uh, we uh, mentioned some people already who uh, contributed to the uh, organization of this event. Many more would be mentioned eventually uh, our sponsors, our partners. I would like to mention a couple of unusual suspects who probably would not be mentioned if I don't do this. First of all, uh, I would like to mention here uh, Timothy Snyder, historian from Yale, who in the um, in spring of 2014, uh, in the first month of Russian invasion in Crimea and Donbass, organized a very powerful international conference in Kiev uh, called uh, Thinking Ukraine, and he brought to Kiev major American and European intellectuals to prove solidarity with the country. And he, uh, he sold some seeds in my subconsciousness. But in order to make them grow up from subconsciousness into consciousness, it took one year, and two more people had to do this, to catalyze this growing. And these two people were uh, uh, John Russell Saul, who is unfortunately not present here, former president of uh, Penn Center, and Andrei Kurkov, uh, vice president of our Penn Center, who uh, two years ago raised this idea. I couldn't believe. Frankly speaking, I, for, for me, it was so, so strange, so fantastic idea, but they insisted. They told that, well, we can do this. We should do this. And uh, we started doing this. And finally, one more person who played a very important role, at least for me, in organizing this event. It was Carlos Todder, with his trademark smile, who all the time 
When I got uh, despaired, frustrated, tired, and uh, wished to give up everything, he told, he calmed me down and told Mekola, you can do this. Mekola, keep on going, you can do this. And we did it. So, my dear colleagues, I would like to thank all these people whom I mentioned. I'd like to also to praise uh, people who helped me to organize this, and without these people, nothing would happen, and of course, it was dream team. It was uh, Ola, it was Bohdana, it was uh, one more Ola, and it was, of course, Ustim Mitsak, who still is probably in Mister, uh, in charge of everything. And uh, it was Mariana, and of course, the uh, city of uh, Lviv, mayor of Lviv, Mr. Sadovy, who is really a great person from my point of view. We had no problems, we did not need to explain him what the Congress is about, what it is, why it is needed, why it should be uh, done in Lviv. So all these people really were very helpful and they, uh, they strengthened my, 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 my faith, my belief in humanity, I would say. Thank you all. Thanks a lot, uh, Mikola. And I must tell you on behalf of our team that to work with you has been not just a great honor, but a real pleasure. Uh, I have an honor to, of inviting to the stage the ambassador of Poland, writer and essayist Jan Peklo. This is a person who has got a lot to say about truth because we understand that Jan Peklo, as the reporter, was trying to highlight the conflict in Yugoslavia and the events in Romania, and he's the author of two nice books about the Balkans. Thank you for that. Thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, it's a great honor for me to speak to such a distinguished audience. <clears throat> and I'm also very happy that my country uh, made a small contribution to, to the Congress. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, it is very symbolic that this Congress takes place in Ukraine, because Ukraine is becoming a very important point of reference for the whole world, for Europe. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was with uh, my minister in Kramatorsk and Avdiivka. Uh, it's eastern part of, of Ukraine. And we managed also to get uh, to the contact line and we saw the damage made to the, to the human dignity. I should also mention that it is very symbolic that we are right now in here, in this place. This place was a church. And the Bolshevik regime desacralized the church and uh, turned it into something completely different. So it is important for all of us to realize that we are in the place which was the church some years ago. Uh, we live in the time of big challenge right now. The liberal democratic values, the democracy is challenged on, on possible levels. A kind of remedy for this, as always, is an art. Art, poetry, visual art, literature. And we have to confront this challenge with our artwork. Uh, I had a temptation to end up uh, my short speech with uh, Ray Bradbury's quote, you must stay drunk on writing so reality can destroy you. But I would like to change it a little bit. We must stay sober and strong on writing so reality can't destroy us. Thank you so much.
And I must recall, remind you that uh, yesterday's evening was greatly supported by our Polish colleagues, in particular by the embassy and by the Polish Institute in Kiev. You remember probably that at the opening ceremony of our Congress we had one video, which we doubted whether it exists or not. So that was the welcoming speech of the Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of Canada to Ukraine, Roman Voschuk. So it is finally here. And I'm reminding you that uh, due to his uh, being too busy, he could not join us, but he um, had a video. Which of course, called Theory of Knowledge and is asking me at home a lot of questions of how do we know what we know? And I think there's a similarity there to the theme of your conference. What is the truth? How is it defined? What is untruth? How is it spread? What is the role of the writer, the public intellectual, in conveying events, defining their framework, conceptualizing and reconceptualizing them? How should public debate be organized? What are its limits? Should there be limits? Uh, these are all questions that uh, you will be addressing over the next few days. For Canadians, freedom of expression is a fundamental value. But uh, so are the rights of individuals and groups not to be unjustly or maliciously maligned. How do we reconcile uh, those two values? Uh, how do we deal with memory? Uh, memory can and indeed probably should be contested, but through what means? Uh, using whose standards? How we talk about our past, individual past, family past, collective past, how we reconcile that with others, differing individual and collective visions is also very important and it's a subject that many Canadian writers have addressed and indeed especially are addressing now with a view to our process of reconciliation with Canada's First Nations. So I'd like to wish all of you uh, a fruitful stay in Lviv, uh, a city of past encounters, both intellectual, personal, sometimes joyful, sometimes tragic. Uh, a background for your reflections, a background for you to work out new ways of addressing what is truth, what is memory, how do we work with them with a view to the future. We will thank Roman Vashuk uh, when we are back in Kyiv, and he is one of the most active ambassadors uh, together with Jan Pekla in Ukraine. And uh, now I want to mention uh, one of our supporters, major supporters of the Congress, which is not one person or two persons, it is Lviv City Council without help and support of which probably this Congress wouldn't be able to take place. I'd like to give floor to the head of the development department of the C Lviv City Council, uh, Mrs. Natalia Bunda, please. Uh, good evening, dear delegates, dear participants of the Congress. It's a great pleasure that our city has had a chance to host your Congress. Thanks to you, our city has been transformed into the international platform for communication. And it was thanks to you that a perennial history of our city uh, continues because when foreigners come to us, when the delegates from all the all around the world come to us for international events and uh, when important decisions are passed, our history continues with us. But the most important thing is that during those ardent uh, debates, truth is born. 
The most important thing is that we talk over challenges and problems and look for ways to settle problems because we are a unique international community. And I would like to stress that over those couple of days you have become real friends of our city. And uh, we are always looking forward to meeting our friends again. So our city, the slogan of which is Leave Open to the World, will always be happy to have you as our guest again and again. So looking forward to meeting you and good luck to all of you and nice uh, come back to our nice city of Lviv. It was a great problem when we prepared our promotional booklets because we didn't know where to place the logo of Lviv City. Uh, council as it a partner general partner information partner or, or what but in fact it includes it all but there is also a great list of institutions and people who made our Congress possible in the form it's, it has lasted and it will still last and you can see this list on our press brochures definitely you can have photos uh, there close to that you must have selfies and check in there in the places where you have been to which you have gone but the main of them are National Endowment for Democracy and our official Renaissance International Renaissance Fund Foundation then Albert Foundation and a number of other ones. We will still keep talking about them today. But the key note, intellectual element of our um, work today is uh, as follows. The time has come to invite to the stage keynote speaker David Patrikarakos with his lecture or talk which is called Fact, Fiction and Politics in the Post-Truth Ages. Please, David. You can hear me? Thank you very much. It, uh, it really is an honor to be here among such esteemed writers and thinkers. Thank you very much, Lviv. And thank God I'm a writer, right? And not something else. I first met Vitaly in Siberia. It was early spring last year. He spoke barely any English, but he was charming. On his right arm, he had a tattoo of the singer Marilyn Manson. On his left leg, he had a tattoo of Winnie the Pooh. I was there to hear Vitaly's story. It was a strange one, something that until the spring of 2014, when I entered Ukraine to cover Russia's invasion, I never would have believed. For a few months in his life, back in 2014, Vitaly, of all people, became a weapon, a weapon of the Russian state in its war against Ukraine. He didn't carry a gun, and he didn't drive a tank, but he was a weapon nonetheless, and one arguably more effective than any fighting on the battlefields of eastern Ukraine. He became a troll. Now, we are all accustomed to trolls. If I stand here, can you still hear me? Okay. Yes? Yeah. We are all accustomed to trolls. They have been around as long as the internet has, basically. But Vitaly was a troll of a different order. Like a bee in a hive, he was just one of many that worked in a nondescript building in St. Petersburg that would later gain infamy as Russia's troll farm or troll factory, a heart of Moscow's online propaganda operations. That's the building. I think we can all agree it's pretty nondescript. Now, it has become almost a cliche to say we live in a post-truth age in which propaganda is triumphing over truth. Indeed, that's the subject of my talk. Nevertheless, the term retains an aphoristic value that is plain to see. Social media has done many good things. It has given a voice to the voiceless. It has shone light where darkness once existed. But through its ability to circumvent traditional media, it has also contributed to the spread of misleading and outright fake information and news that in its ability to reach wide audiences is unprecedented in modern history. Users flood Twitter with hoaxes and doctored images. Facebook is awash with detailed conspiracies blaming world crises on the Illuminati or a secret world order. The serpent of anti-Semitism has risen once again, spitting its venom into cyberspace. This is a fact the Kremlin understands perfectly and lies at the heart of its propaganda. 
Just as Ukrainians took to social media, I saw them do this in 2014, they took to social media to expose Kremlin aggression on the battlefields, so the Kremlin inevitably fought back to both justify its actions and more importantly, to shroud them in a bewildering array of narratives to distort, con distort truth and confuse its enemies. Question more. That is the slogan of Moscow's most prominent international propaganda arm, the TV channel RT. Now, RT best articulates this strategy. In 2016, it received around $250 million from the Russian state, and it accords strictly to the government line. Its goals are clear. Through outlets like RT, the Kremlin doesn't seek to gain global approval. This is the interesting thing. It doesn't seek necessarily to promote a positive image of Moscow. What it seeks to do is to sow discord, confusion, and an erosion in all sources of truth amongst its perceived enemy. Its slogan, question more, becomes in effect, trust less. And central to achieving this goal is social media. And encapsulated in that fight, for a brief time, and just as a minor player, was Vitaly. It was early August 2014 in the Russian city of St. Petersburg. Vitaly was just starting a new job. He was a journalist and had lost his previous job when the website closed due to a lack of funding. He found a new job at an innocuously named media company. And so began one of the most surreal and in the end unpleasant experiences of his life. Vitaly was immediately put to work on a project. The project was called Ukraine 2. The goal was to rewrite articles from elsewhere and put them on a website, and the website was called worldukraine.com.ua. Now, that UA URL is vital, because as you will understand and no doubt guess, it was meant to make it look like the website was based in Ukraine and not in St. Petersburg. So, he wrote, rewrote articles. It was easy for him, journalist. Uh, but there were rules. It was propaganda. This is propaganda, after all. When describing Russia-backed Ukrainian separatists, he needed to change words like terrorist and separatist into militia. Instead of Ukrainian army, he had to write volunteer battalions, uh, as there is a lot of stuff about them containing sometimes fairly far-right and thuggish elements. Also, to convince Ukrainians that the text was genuine, he would use stylistic tricks. He would rewrite text, making it friendlier to Ukrainian eyes. So, and please excuse my pronunciation here, he always made sure you to use the preposition voi instead of na when talking about Ukraine. Voi Ukraine, in Ukraine, the former suggesting Ukraine is not a fully fledged country, is, but something along the Russian border, is essentially the Russian usage of it. Uh, whereas, I oh know I've got that wrong. Why Ukraine? Is, yeah. Uh, but now Ukraine on the border. Do we understand? Great. Thank you. Sorry. As time passed, it became clear to Vitaly that he was a player in an all-out information war. He couldn't hide it to himself anymore. He was working in a troll factory. And this troll factory had a clear structure. It had a clear, clear, rigid hierarchy. Vitaly works on the first floor pumping out the fake websites. On the second floor was the social media department. Here, people created memes and cartoons to spread around social media in support of Kremlin policies. On the third floor were the bloggers. And there were two types, as you can see. There were the Ukrainian bloggers, who would blog about how terrible life was in Ukraine, how the kindergartens didn't have enough food, how parts of the city didn't have electricity. And then there were the foreign language bloggers, usually pretending to be Americans, saying how America supported Putin's policy in Ukraine and how the Ukrainians were fascists. Uh, it actually became a, a bit of a joke for Vitaly and his colleagues because when they were writing their false articles, their American source wasn't actually based in Washington but was based two floors up. It was a merry-go-round of lies. Surreal, it was. The fourth floor contained the people whose job it was to post comments on social media, and they were the kings of the troll farms. These were the people that posted comments on Facebook, Twitter, and most of all, Vikontakta, the Russian version of Facebook, which is now uh, banned in Ukraine, as I uh, understand it. Well, I tried to access it, so it is. After a month into Vitaly's time at the farm, he was sent to the second floor, where to join the cartoon and make meme makers. 
Now his only job had switched from writing to essentially just promoting the farm's websites. Um, now, in order to register an account uh, for something like Vcontact, you have to have uh, a phone number. Now, that wasn't a problem. He was just given a bag full of SIM cards with which he registered multiple fake accounts. Interestingly, and this is a common theme you see in propaganda of this nature, he was told to make the accounts female as it was assumed that female profiles would be believed more than male ones. Now, we have this belief, and this is something, again, that I run up again, against, again, again, and again, that Russians, who I have, as a people, great respect for, but there is this belief that they're all chess-playing grandmasters thinking 17 moves ahead. I mean, off, often this propaganda, as Vitaly told me, was just stupid. Essentially, so many of his profiles would get banned because they just spam everything. They spam people's home pages with articles about Donbass fascists on pages that had nothing to do with them. In one instance, to a group devoted to meeting up for sex near the Ural Mountains. So these sorts of things would just get banned. But again, the goal was twofold. The first was to shore up the Kremlin's own constituency. It was to support the true believers and it was to give them ammunition on which to fight in the social media space, to give them a narrative to promulgate. The second, and more bemusing to, ben, more bemusing to, ben, uh, to Vitaly, but more important and more dangerous to people like us and to anyone who cares about truth, was to sow as much confusion as possible, to counteract the realities on the ground with counter-narratives. But here's the thing, counter-narratives made forceful, not by the strength of their obviously false content, but by their sheer volume. That is the key to it. Now, another thing, another great truism I've encountered in dealing and discussing this subject is attention spans in the social media age. Vitaly was told, look, most people don't read the text or even follow the link. You're, you're trying to compete with people who are scrolling through their phone. You've got maybe one second to capture their attention. So even if you get them to stop, your meme or cartoon has to be a way of leaving the message in itself. So he spent countless hours conjuring up memes about Ukrainian fascists, the greatness of Putin, and the perniciousness of figures um, perceived as hostile to Russia. Angela Merkel was a favorite, uh, Ukrainian politicians, and above all, Barack Obama. So let's just see some examples of Vitaly's work. So here we have a picture of Obama supposedly looking tearful, saying, I want to start a war, but none of my friends will join me. Vitaly got a particularly good response from this, a two-panel meme. And the first, we see Obama looking angry, saying, we don't talk to terrorists. In the second, he's shown smiling with the caption, we just sponsor them. He also created this, which is fairly self-explanatory. It was pretty basic stuff, but it did the trick. And so, like most people do in jobs, Vitaly settled into a routine. Critically, as well as attacking Western and Ukrainian leaders, the goal was to, produce, to boost the separatists. One memorable meme, and this gives you an idea of the kind of level of people that he was, you know, appealing to, featured um, the famously then attractive prosecutor general of Crimea, uh, who actually went over to the separatist side when uh, the Russians invaded. And the words Crimea and Russia, you can see top and tail, the cartoon. And they were linking to an article entitled Crimea is ours and so are the visas, which informed Crimean citizens that they would soon be getting EU Schengen visas, if you can imagine such a thing. But after a few months in, Vitaly couldn't take it anymore. As you can guess from his tattoos and his piercings, he was a liberal kind of guy, but he needed the money. But it was really getting to him. He thought what he was doing was wrong. He felt dirty. He felt he couldn't bear it anymore. So one day, he had decided to say six months. In the end, after three months, he'd had enough. So he went to his boss, Anna, and said that he wanted to quit. She asked him why, and he was honest with her. She took him to, he, she took him to the canteen, and they had a discussion. He said, look, I don't believe in what I'm doing. I'm sorry. So he left. But still, he couldn't get the experience out of his mind. He felt dirty. He wanted to atone. So he decided to write an expose of the troll farm. So he tried a few websites in St. Petersburg. Eventually one was interested and he wrote one. He did it anonymously and also he tried to imply through the text that he was a female because most of the employees were women. Uh, Alexander Navalny even tweeted it. Unfortunately, his attempts at anonymity weren't so successful. 
About an hour after it came out, Anna sent him a message saying that you may think you're really a hero, but you're just a little son of a bitch who only can spoil things for other people who are trying to do good. Go figure. So then the phone call started. What the hell do you think you're doing? A gruff male voice down, growled down the phone at him. Don't you know people can get punched in the face for this sort of thing? For a while, he was made afraid to walk the streets alone. Now, if you are tempted to dismiss Vitali's stories and the actions of a troll farm as a bunch of losers playing around on the internet, don't. Because when Vitali joined the troll farm, he enlisted in the Russian army. He may have not worn a uniform or carried a gun, but he was a soldier nonetheless, a virtual one, fighting a war at the narrative level. And every meme he created or fake article he wrote was just one more virtual bullet he, filed, he fired into the social media space. And every person who linked to that article on Facebook or Twitter or shared that meme enlisted too. With a single press of the tweet or the share button, they became their own little propaganda machine for the cause. And in this army, there are almost no bars to entry. Anyone can join up. It's the virtual form of total war. Anyone with an internet uh, connection can take up, can take part. And it is effective. As I journeyed through eastern Ukraine as the towns and cities fell almost daily to pro-Russia separatists in early spring 2014, the effects of Russia's blitzkrieg were plain to see. Online content that could have come directly from Vitaly's virtual pen had seeped into the offline world. All media, said the Canadian philosopher Marshall McEwen, are extensions of some faculty, psychic or physical, in eastern Ukraine, it was as if Putin's central nervous system was on display. Old men parroted geopolitical concepts like Novorossiya, a czarist term to describe parts of southeastern Ukraine, in detail to me that they clearly didn't understand. Teenagers laughingly showed me racist memes of Barack Obama on their smartphones. Beliefs in, the fa in fantastical notions that Kiev, their own capital city, wanted to destroy the speaking of Russian in and wanted to persecute and kill, were sending snipers to kill Eastern Ukrainians, were sincerely held. This wasn't the promulgation of a narrative. It was the reinvention of reality. Now, the US Joint Forces Command defines so-called hybrid war, which is traditionally regarded as the latest developing complex, as warfare that simultaneously and adaptively employs a tailored mix of conventional, irregular terrorism and criminal means or activities in the operational battlefield space. This is to say, tanks and weapons are no longer the most important methods of fighting. What I saw in Ukraine is hybrid war for the 21st century. And in this war, war, guns, rockets and tanks are less important than twist, posts and shares. So, how did we get here? Now, information war is as old as warfare itself. What has changed is where once battlefield operations, inf where once information operations supported battlefield operations, now battlefield operations increasingly support information ones. Putin's information war could only be possible in a post-truth age, or the successes it has had. And what has created this age is social media. Social media was supposed to connect and unite us. It cares little for barriers. It was supposed to be transnational. It was supposed to bring us together. And to a degree, it's true. And right now, I can speak to a friend in the US or in London or in Athens or Rome instantly over Facebook. But it has also shattered unity and divided people. And it does this in two overarching ways. The first is obvious. It sets people at loggerheads, especially in times of crisis like war. So you'll all have seen it on your Facebook and Twitter feed. You'll have seen the pro-Russians, the pro-Ukrainians on Twitter arguing with each other. I'm British. I saw people on my Facebook feed furiously arguing over Brexit, people unfriending each other. Then let's not even start on Donald Trump and the divisions that cause. So that's the obvious way. The second way it divides people is more insidious. The majority of young people now receive their news from social media. And what they receive depends on who they friend or follow and the type of content they post. Now, generally, 
our circle of friends, or the people we f follow on Twitter, less so Twitter, but Facebook, tend to be people broadly, and I use the word broadly similar. I'm not saying if you're a Democrat, you're not going to have Republican Facebook friends, or if you're a Labour supporter in Britain, you're not gonna have Conservative friends, of course you're not. But it is unlikely that amongst your friends group, you're going to be friends with a bunch of Nazis, I hope not, or jihadists, or, uh, you know, KKK members, whatever. I mean, we broadly cocoon ourselves within, you know, like-minded people. And when people traverse that line, like if someone posts something particularly racist on my thing, I don't know, I'll say, who's this guy? Well, I'm getting rid of him. So anyway, so we are cocooned. We receive our information from social media because it is essentially a content provider. People post articles. That's where I find most of my articles. I rarely go to the source. And generally, those articles tend to conform to our pre-existing beliefs. Then we have to understand what social media platforms are. You know, there is this belief, almost instinctive, that it's just a neutral platform on which you talk to people. It's not. They are capitalist enterprises designed to make money. And their product is us. And their goal is to keep us on their platforms for as long as possible. And they do this through the use of algorithms, which based on our habits, it calculates, they, it calculates to feed us content they know we will like. So we are cocooned twice, first by the people we friend and follow, and secondly by the algorithm, which feeds us with content they know we like, it knows we like. This results in what is known as homophily, homo homophily meaning literally love of the same in which, as I've outlined, individuals bond with like-minded others who reinforce their worldview, which is then exacerbated by algorithms that feed them desirable content. In essence, platforms like Facebook, let alone Vitali, become little mini propaganda machines, feeding us with what we know we like, reinforcing our worldview, blocking our opposing views, thus our prejudices reaffirmed and hatred of the other exacerbated. The problem now that we face is that social media is then an inherently destabilizing technology. But critically, it has coincided at a time of crisis in the West, which since the early 2000s has seen the systematic discrediting of its major institutions. We start with the politicians, the, our leaders, who took the West to war against Iraq based on a lie. We then go to 2008, our financial sector's irresponsible behavior nearly brought financial catastrophe down on us. Then we go to Edward Snowden's spying revelations, that our state that was supposed to be protecting us was in fact spying on us. You combine this with longer term trends of declining trust in the media, and you see that every pillar of the establishment, the financial, security, media, uh, political, has been discredited. And what has allowed, this has allowed a nationalist demagogues like Gert Wilders, Marine Le Pen to rise across Europe, Brexit, Nigel Farage, and Trump to win the US presidency. And lest we ever forget, this is the smaller, as if I hope you don't mind me saying asshole. And this is the king one. So this is what this age has brought us. Our information environment is unhealthy. We live in a world where facts are less important than narratives, where people emote rather than debate, and where algorithms shape our view of the world. In 2006, post-truth was named word of the year by Oxford Dictionaries, and it is worth defining. It was defined as an adjective relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal beliefs. Now, according to the Oxford Judiciary President, the reason they chose this, it's not surprising that our choice reflects a year dominated by highly charged political and social discourse, fueled by the rise of social media as a news source and the growing distrust of facts offered up by the establishment. Post-truth as a concept has been finding its linguistic footing for some time. Now, in both, the UK, in both Europe and the US, public broadcasters have to adhere to guidelines regarding balance and impartiality. No such regulation of social media exists. Facebook, 
which has been named as the platform most conducive to the spread of false stories, has now been forced to, to uh, allow users to flag what they perceive to be false content, which will then be checked by third-party fact-checking organizations like Snopes. And the need is urgent. In 2006, Pakistan's defense minister publicly threatened Israel with nuclear war on Twitter because of a fake article that had been published. But in the end, in the end of all this, what is the worst thing that the post-truth age has brought us? It has brought us the post-truth leader. From Vladimir Putin, who can reinvent, reinvent reality on the ground in eastern Ukraine, to Donald Trump, who can lie about the size of his inauguration crowns when you can see that he's lying. Now look, to be fair, the two men still remain different. One is a dictator in all but name, the other leads the world's most powerful democracy. But in each case, the goal is the same. Not to twist the truth like the politicians of old, but to subvert the very notion that an objective truth exists at all. This is the key. So all very cheerful as we head towards the end of my talk. So what do we do? What can we do to combat this pro-truth age? What can we do to fight against our sick information environment. It's a hard task and real change, I think, will in the end have to come at the legislative level. Social media, we're still in the very wild west days of it. But I think there are a few things you can do to make sure you don't live your life cocooned in your own information bubble. So I put together a little mini survival kit for our post-truth age. One, go out of your friend, go out of your way to friend or follow people that don't agree with your worldview. I'm not telling you to befriend Nazis. Don't go and befriend Nazis, but people who think a little differently to you. You will find that it broadens your views. Equally, most people now, as I said, read articles that they see posted on Facebook or Twitter. Go directly to the websites of trusted news sources, or better still, buy the newspaper itself. Read all its reporting. Don't cherry-pick articles with a slant that appeals to your pre-existing beliefs. Oh, and read articles from publications whose political views you don't agree with. You will learn something. Trust me. Read books. As we all know, they do still exist. One is coming out in mid-November. It's called War in 140 Characters, How Social Media is Reshaping Conflict in the 21st Century. It's well worth checking out. Available for pre-order on Amazon but books, and generally they will give you a greater depth of coverage than an eight-word article belted out on deadline by a journalist. Four, and this has been known since Shakespeare, mistrust the mob. Fake news spreads because fake articles are sensationalist and are retweeted and endlessly. Just because an article is popular doesn't mean it's any good. Beware clickbait. And finally, log off. Facebook will suck your life. Go outside, have a coffee, see your friends. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you.